Hokshi. Recorded live. Hello, everybody. This is Jörg Lissmann again from Juggler 66 uh, on another broadcast, or the second broadcast in the history that we started, Hour of the Truth. It is today, March 19th, 2015, Thursday evening for me in Belgium, and Thursday somewhere in the morning over there in United States of America, of, or Romerica, as I like to call it also. We are going today uh, again into the broadcast that we started last week already that was uh, about the Catholic Lutheran Accord, a paper by, written by Richard Bennett to explain how, <clears throat> sorry, how the apostate, so-called apostate Protestant churches had to get back under the wings of Rome. Before that, I'd like first of all to repeat the motto of our broadcast, that you still keep that in mind. What is the reason why we are doing this? What is our motivation behind that? And the motto of our broadcast is that Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and send the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed. The goal still stays the same extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. And where can you see that Jesus Christ is the truth? Well, in John 14, verse 6, it says, quote, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, unquote. And a lot of the things that we will cover in the Catholic Lutheran Accord and also in other broadcasts here is that the Roman Catholic Church states there is no salvation outside the church and that is exactly the opposite of the things taught by Jesus Christ 2000 years ago and of course it is up to you that whether you want to believe a man or you want to believe Jesus Christ who also was a man but who was sent by God and who was God on earth. He was God infested in the flesh in that time and died for all our sins 2,000 years ago. And I also advise you to go back and we will probably go longer into that another time into the study of Daniel's 70th week prophecy, Daniel chapter 9 and most especially the verses 23 to 27 to get a real understanding of it and to understand the futurist agenda that the Roman Catholic Church put out there in 1590, starting with Alcazar and Ribera, when they turned away the attention from what the Protestants said the Pope or the papacy is the Antichrist. And then the Counter-Reformation came in the form of the Council of Trent, and later on in 1590, you had a Jesuit Ribera writing the so-called theory of futurism, that the Antichrist is one single person that comes in the far distant future. And this is what they have been playing all along. They have created a matrix, created a world for us to live in, where everything is brought into that fruition. So when you don't study the Bible and you do not understand Daniel verse Daniel 9, verse 23 to 27, you will surely be deceived and not understand the whole truth. As last time, I also this time have two guests with me here on the show. First of all, Walt Stickel, who made this broadcast possible by starting the talk show call up. Walt, how are you doing? Welcome. It's, I'm glad to be here, and, uh, and it's uh, got sunny skies and this, on Oregon coast, so... Looking forward to the broadcast. Well, it all starts out with good weather in the first place. We have missed here all day in uh, Belgium and uh, didn't see the sun. And tomorrow we have an eclipse, and I probably won't see that also. i uh, just going to see that it's getting dark, I guess. And my second guest on the show, my friend Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. I very much welcome you, Tom, to the show. Hello, how yeah. are you? Thanks for the invitation, Yerk. Uh, good afternoon to you and to your listeners, and uh, very much looking forward to the uh, program today. Me too. 
But before we go into the Catholic Lutheran Accord and uh, go further into reading it and uh, studying the analysis of it, like we did last week, I want to quote two news that I got from a webpage that is called uh, www.news.va. means that comes from the Vatican. You know, in the end of this year, in September of 2015, the Pope is to visit the United States of America. To me, that is the perfect uh, symbolism of um, Revelation 13 fulfilled, the mirror. When you stand in front of a mirror, what do you see? An image of yourself, right? So when the first beast, which is the Vatican, comes over to the United States of America, which is the second beast, and he comes there and speaks on behalf, very important part that was said, he speaks on behalf of the American people. Isn't that the mirror? Isn't that the image that he portrays of himself? And because this is such a very important week, uh, the 24th of September, I think it starts until the end of the month September that he comes to visit the United States of America, we have to be vigilant and see what is he doing in all the meantime, what is leading up to that visit. And so by that, I chose that site to take a few news right from the Vatican website itself and to see what he says about some things. At first, there is an article called, The Pope Says a Society Can Be Judged by the Way It Treats Its Children. I think this is very interesting to go a little bit into, and it's also a very small article, but I will just read it, and then uh, Tom and I will probably discuss the implementations of this and what, on the one hand, that he says, and on the other hand, what he doesn't say, and on the third hand, what is actually meant by all that. So I'm going to quote the article right now. Pope Francis today turned his thoughts to the countless children across the world who live in poverty and need. Addressing the crowds in St. Peter's Square gathered for the weekly general audience, the Pope continued in his catechesis on the family, focusing his time, uh, this time on children. <clears throat> Pope Francis said that children are a great gift for humanity and for the Church. Recalling the many happy children he met during his recent journey to Asia, brimming with life and enthusiasm, he said that, on the other hand, he thinks of the countless children throughout our world who are living in poverty and need. Quote, a society can be judged by the way it treats its children, unquote, he said. The Pope said that children remind us that from our earliest years we are dependent on others. We see this in Jesus himself, who was born a child in Bethlehem. This, he said, is a precious reminder of the fact the necessary condition to enter the reign of God is to never consider ourselves self-sufficient, but the need of help, love, and forgiveness. He said that children also remind us that we are always sons and daughters. This identify, he remains, reminds us that we have been given the gift of life, that we never cease to be radically dependent. And speaking of the many gifts that children bring to humanity, Francis said they challenge us to see things with a simple, pure, and trusting heart. They have the capacity to receive and to offer warmth and tenderness, to laugh and cry freely in response to the world around us. And he pointed to a child's spontaneous trust in his mother and father, in God, Jesus, and in Our Lady, and said Jesus urges us to become like children, since God's kingdom belongs to such as these. That's from Matthew 18, verse 3. Pope Francis concluded, inviting all to, quote, welcome and treasure our children who bring so much life, joy, and hope to the world, unquote. How sad and bleak would our world be without him, he said, and ended the statement there, and that ends the article here. Well, the Pope suddenly becomes the attorney of all the children, right? He says that the children are a great gift for humanity and for the Church. Well, you can interpret that the way that he says, or you can interpret that the way that he does. What's the difference, Tom? Well, the difference is biblical. 
and it contradicts just about everything that Pope Francis says in this article. First of all, Christ said that Christ, the Bible says that Christ is the head of the church, and we are all brethren. And we are not to be dependent upon the church or the state. We were to be in this world, but not of it. We were supposed to be independent, each possessing uh, the Holy Spirit, indwelling us and guiding us into all truth. We were to be uh, receive our blessings from God alone. And we were to be independent, each answering to him and him only. And through the abundance of living a godly life and eating only from God's table, we were to be sufficient in and of ourselves with Christ as our head and and the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And then to take care of our neighbor as we would have them take care of us, but not with the state or with the church as a middleman. God's house is made of charity. And when one is blessed with the fruits of his labor and not being robbed by the state through punitive taxation, one has plenty with which to give those who uh, are of like mind. But in the state system, the church-state system that we dwell in today, we are convinced that the state uh, is, is the charitable institution that provides for its people and not God. And therefore, we are subject to heavy taxation. And we pay that heavy taxation so that the government of the United States can redistribute that wealth to whomever it sees fit. And that's how the the the, the uh, that's how the blessed of the Lord are saddled with supporting the wicked. It was never to be that way in God's kingdom. When in Israeli in Jewish history did God command the people to collect taxes to pay the heathen nations? Uh, and, and alleviate their suffering. Never once in all of God's book was it commanded of the Jews to collect taxes and to redistribute their wealth to the poor pagan nations around them. But that's what we do here in the United States of America. And what is the basis for Pope Francis's diatribe about children in this country? The Roman Catholic Church has a law. No one may have God as father who does not have church as mother. And what does a mother do to her children? She nurtures and admonishes and and punishes and guides and directs and provides every need. That is the role that the Vatican sees for itself, that it provides for every need. It is the teacher, it is the admonisher, it is the corrector, and it is the uh, the mother of us all. Very good point, and, there, Tom. Very I good tried. point. So, sorry, sorry. I just want to say a little further in the uh, in, in in the article that I just read. It says the Pope said that children remind us that from our earliest years we are dependent on others. And this absolutely fits in what you've just said. Today, the people are always dependent on the state. When, for example, you look in the United States of America, for this moment being, you have about 50 million people depending on food stamps. You have people depending on um, the money they get when they don't work. Uh, How do you call that? Unemployment benefits. Un- un- unemployment benefits, right. Or uh, benefits from Social Security, 
uh, from becoming Obamacare and all that stuff. And um, you really go right into into this point. It the the Pope wants us to be dependent from cradle to grave. And for I think all of our needs, he, for all of our needs, not just. Yeah. Not just our physical needs, but our spiritual needs as well. Most certain, our sp- uh, our spiritual needs, but first and for all, um, our material needs that we have. Because when we are then dependent on the states, and of course the Vatican is the melting of state and church, so we are dependent on the church as well as on the state, then they have us in their full grip that they want to. And we have no possibility to find Jesus on ourselves anymore. Because a personal relationship with Jesus is forbidden in the Roman Catholic Church. But please go on. I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but I thought that was a very interesting point to make here right now. Yes, it was very, it was very, uh, uh, a point, uh, it was very poignant in what you said. You, your assessments uh, of what I said are accurate. And, but but I must make the link for the listeners. How does the state come in? The Vatican says one may not have God as father who does not have church as mother. Now, it is the Roman Catholic Church's role to be the teacher, the admonisher, uh, and all of that, education, everything comes from the church. But the role of 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 administering the church's role is through the government, through the civil laws of every land. That is the proper role of government according to the papacy. So that's why our taxes go to Washington, D.C., and then they're redistributed according to church teaching, Roman Catholic church teaching. And this is precisely how The godly provide for the wicked. It is the godly who strengthen the wicked in this country by the very system that is set up, the government. The proper role of civil government is to serve the church. Any government of the world that does not serve the church is called by the Vatican a government uh, de facto. In other words, it is a government in fact, but it has not subjected itself to the authority of the church. A government that does serve the church and does the church's bidding through its civil laws and through its systems of every kind, education, finance, you name it, any church that does obey Roman Catholic uh, uh, Vatican doctrine is regarded as a, a a government du jour. The United States government is a government du jour. It takes our money, our tax money, 60% of it that goes to the IRS goes directly to the Jesuit order. That was revealed by a, a World Bank a whistleblower by the name of Karen Hudis. Sixty percent of the tax money goes directly to the Jesuit order, and they own the the Federal Reserve Bank through the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds manage it, and uh, the rest of the taxes that we pay go to be redistributed around the country to drug addicts, uh, the wicked. Let's just put it that way. And so there is no difference between the holy and the profane. Now, is this not what, is, what God judged Israel for? Because they made no difference between the holy and the profane? That Israel strengthened the wicked? That's not the way we're supposed to live. That's not the way God's people are supposed to live. We are, we are in this world, but we are not to be of it. But we find today that every Christian, virtually every Christian, is forced by law to be of the world. Otherwise, you are in direct violation of the civil law. So here we have to pay the tax man, and what he does with our God-given wealth, the fruits of our labor, we no longer are free 
to charitably give to the righteous and strengthen the righteous. But our goods and our and our labor and our gain is collected by the government and redistributed on behalf of the papacy to the wicked. And that's what every system in the world is built up to do, to take from the righteous to strengthen the wicked. <clears throat> now, how much love can the Vatican have for children when its entire system is built to take from the righteous to support the wicked? I recall in many of the books that I've read, and I've read hundreds of books in my last 15 years of research in this matter, what has Rome done to the children in history? What has Rome done to the children of the righteous throughout history? In the, first, in the Third and Fourth Vatican Councils, it was decreed that anyone who was not a Roman Catholic was a heretic, and that it was not only not a sin to kill a heretic, but that it was a meritorious work. In other words, one could receive grace from God for killing a heretic. <clears throat> and when one was caught reading the Bible in his own language, one was regarded as a heretic. And at that point, once de defined as a heretic, one was not allowed to buy or to sell. No one was to give succor or comfort to a heretic. Rome killed the heretics and then confiscated all of their property, giving a certain portion of it to the state for, for actually doing the work of the church and killing the heretics. It was always given to the state to do that, to extirpate and to annihilate the heretics from their realms. They would kill the parents who were reading the scriptures. They would deny them a burial. Their bodies were thrown in the gutters for the dogs to eat. Their property was confiscated by the state. The state took so much of it. The rest of it went to the Roman Catholic Church. The children were either killed with their parents or they were taken off to monasteries and nunneries to be raised up in Roman Catholicism, the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. That's the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church. That's how they operated during the Dark Ages, during the Old World Order. Today, in the New World Order, that Old World Order is being restored. Remember this and never forget, the New World Order is not new at all. The New World Order is simply the restoration of the Old World Order, where the state serves the Roman Catholic Church, where the state takes from the righteous and gives to the wicked and strengthens the wicked, where the state persecutes, prosecutes, and denies the basic necessities of life, health care and every other form of, of necessity from the righteous and confiscates their property and redistributes their wealth. To become a, if one wished to become a third-class citizen in the United States of America, all one has to do is proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven, the way God established it, not the way the papacy has established it. So what do we say about this pope who goes about kissing the cheeks of little children and endearing himself to the parents all over the world, and then putting himself in a position as mother of all the churches, as the teacher, admonisher, and as the ruler of all the civil governments, that all these systems work to comply with Roman Catholic canon law. No man may have God as father who does not have church as mother. A global union of church and state where the entire system from the foundation all the way to the peak of the roof is designed to take from the righteous and give to the wicked. 
to strengthen the wicked. You want to know why this world is wicked? Because the state supports the wickedness. Because the CIA, the government of this country, actually peddles the drugs. People are becoming aware of this. And what is Pope Francis? What is Pope Francis but a liar? And nowhere is it more evident than in the global, the global priest-pedophile pandemic. No one will ever know how many pedophile priests there are among the ranks of the Roman Catholic priesthood until God actually comes and exposes them all. But even the the government-controlled mainstream medias can no longer remain silent about this global scourge. Priest after priest after priest in Roman Catholic countries and even in once Protestant countries like the United States, the pedophile priest pandemic is exploding. The Vatican is protecting the priests and persecuting the accusers, making victims of their own victims. And no one dare cry out about it. No one dare say anything about it because you're Catholic bashing. No one may ever read and discuss Fox's Book of Martyrs and exposing how Rome operated during the Old World Order. Because if one does, one might recognize the same order being established right here, right now. And any pope who goes about this world championing the plight of children, no matter where they are, is cosmic hypocrisy. Cosmic hypocrisy. That's the only way I can describe it. And it's insufficient to describe the horror that the Roman Catholic Church has been to children, not only in our age, but all previous ages, all the way back to the founding of that church. It's unbelievable what the Vatican can propound about itself with nary any objection or protest from God's people anywhere in the world. But at Inquisition Update, we believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture. And history proves it to be true. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, um, that was very important what you just said there. And I just want to go back to that uh, pedophile point that you made. Uh, in the recent times, as far as I know, it goes back well, two, three years maybe from now. So started somewhere in 2012, probably started earlier. But we have, for example, in Germany, the country where I was born and raised, a new kind of raising our children. And I mean, that's in the sense of how the children are being raised when they attend public schools. And this is certainly a reason why the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, will never be accused of any pedophiles in the future. I'm very much convinced of this. You can fight me on this 24 hours a day. I don't care. But the point is, in Germany, for example, in the country or in the land, you know, Germany is, is, uh, is, is uh, 16 Länder, 16 Bundesländer, 16 states like you have in the United States of America. For example, in the country of Baden-Württemberg, there is an official PDF document from the, minister, from the, from the, uh, from the Department of um, Education on the school that uses a PDF file that I have on my PC. You cannot longer get this online, I think, but I took it off, but I have it saved on my PC. Where they state explicitly how they are doing sexual education, starting with children in kindergarten when they are three to four years old. 
And these papers are based on the Kinsey Report. Now, my dear listener, if you have never heard of Kinsey or the Kinsey Report, who he was, what he was, just Google it. You write his name K-I-N-S-E-Y, the Kinsey Report. He was a pedophile. He was a child rapist. He gave children of three months multiple orgasms in studies of sexual education. And this early sexualization is going so far in Germany that there are regular protests over right now. This and last year that have been there in Frankfurt and in, uh, in Frankfurt and uh, Cologne. <clears throat> there have been mass demonstrations about from, from concerned parents who said children need love, no sex. And they were attacked by the LGBTQ, I don't know how you're going to call this, you know, this lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual community. There were, when the, when, the, when the children and their parents were on the streets protesting against this new policy, this new state policy of early child sexualization and child uh, sexual education, in, uh, in the kindergarten and of course later on in the school there are protests from the other side from this LGBT uh, people gay, lesbians, you know what I mean about that this rainbow organization you know, they have the rainbow as, uh, as their motto uh, all colors doesn't matter what sex you have doesn't matter who you love as long as you love each other, probably. And there are raids, there are raids going on during this uh, demonstrations out there. And these uh, gay people organizations attacked the parents and their children who were peacefully demonstrating and peacefully just um, exercising their right of free speech and the, free to, the, 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 um, the freedom to assemble and to demonstrate for what they think is right. And they were attacked all along. And um, well, when you understand German, then you should go to Klagemauer TV, uh, Wailing TV uh, is that called, uh, Wailing, Wailing Wall TV is that called, this is a German channel who brings out a lot of these truths. And I don't agree with everything that is said on that channel, to be sure, but... It brings out a lot of these news, but it's, it's always in German. But uh, I think you will have the same uh, in all the other countries. And what is the idea behind that? When you have children in your kindergarten and you teach these children when you are four or five years old and you say to a boy and a girl, well, no, you go undress and you touch each other everywhere and you see how much fun it is and this and that, and that is the way that they are educated there. Of course, because it is based on the Kinsey Report, don't forget that, read that report, study that. Then you know that the child will have no, uh, how do you say that, no, no, no borders anymore. Uh, it will have no, no problem anymore being touched and all that stuff. And by taking this natural defense away, that is a way to legalize pedophilia. And when with all this early sexualization and gender, uh, uh, gender madness that they are going to do about gays and lesbians and transsexuals and intersexuals and transsexuals, and I, I don't know all the names that they have there, when they take all the borders away, from one generation, all it takes is the next generation, and the next generation, of course, will be much worse than the generation before that. And we have seen that in the past. Because what started as a sexual, re sexual revolution in the 1960s, with free love and all that stuff, remember the times of Woodstock, and I don't know what, time, uh, what happened there all the time, with that free love, look to what that led us today. 60 years ago, a Hollywood movie and there was a big French kiss on the, on the big screen and the people went out of the cinema and said, wow, this is, uh, this is, I, I, I cannot take this, this is too much sex. And today, what do you have today on the screens and all that? 
But I don't want to take all the time. Tom, I think you uh, certainly have something to say to that uh, early uh, child education, sexual education uh, on, on yourself and, and want to come into this point. So please support me a little bit because I'm sometimes I'm looking for my work. Certainly, <laughs> certainly the, state has, uh, the state has served the church, the Roman Catholic Church, by sexualizing our children at a young age, kindergarten and before, even in preschool. Sexualizing the children is to be to produce sexual chaos, and a, and a and a total totally dependent society, because when a child raises a child, he cannot support the child, and it's an extra burden upon the family, and then it becomes an extra burden upon the state. The better to justify higher and higher taxes to take from the godly and give to the righteous, the unrighteous to strengthen the unrighteous. And uh, that's the name of Rome's game, to take from the righteous to strengthen the unrighteous. Now, this pope claims to be a defender of children. But don't forget, this is a Jesuit pope, the first Jesuit pope in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. This particular pope, Jorge Uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio was a Jesuit provincial in Argentina. This Jesuit pope oversaw the overthrow of the duly elected government of Argentina in favor of a Nazi-backed military junta. And this Nazi-backed military junta was installed by the Vatican through Pope uh, Francis I to protect the records that had been that had come to light in Argentina, uh, where the Vatican, together with the CIA, uh, opened the the rat lines they were called, where they hustled the the war criminals, the Nazi war criminals from Germany and Europe and brought them to safe haven down in Argentina. And of course, there were records of all this taking place. And those records were about to be made public by the the duly elected government of Argentina. And the, the Vatican had to go into overdrive to cover up their part in the Vatican rat lines. And that's why the Nazi style uh, regime overthrew the duly elected government of Argentina. It was a Vatican overthrow of the government, led by Jorge Bergoglio, the current Pope, Francis I. Now, what came of this? Thousands and thousands of people simply disappeared. And the stories that came out of Argentina were that these, that the opponents of this Nazi regime, this Vatican-backed Nazi regime, led by Jorge Bergoglio, were literally <clears throat> taken up in helicopters, taken out over the Atlantic Ocean, and dropped from hundreds of feet to their deaths. And they simply disappeared. Mothers and fathers, along with their children. And some of the children were even, as Rome has always done in the past, simply taken from the parents and put in state-sponsored schools, Nazi-sponsored schools, Roman Catholic-sponsored schools, nuns, nunneries, and monasteries to be raised up Roman Catholic. It was a modern-day inquisition, the likes of which could be recognized by anybody familiar with history. Rome is still doing today what she has always done, overthrowing governments de facto for governments de jure overthrowing governments that will are disobedient to the Vatican, which the duly elected government of Argentina was, they were going to expose the Vatican's role in, in the Vatican rat lines and all the Nazis that found refuge in Argentina and protected by the church, protected by Jorge Bergoglio, cardinal at that time. And they confiscated the children. Now, they murdered many of the children right along with their parents, just dropped them off into the ocean, disappeared. No one knows where they went. 
but they're just suddenly gone. Their bodies have never been found. 45,000. And who knows how many children were, were taken off into Roman Catholic nunneries and monasteries to be raised Roman Catholic to help strengthen this Nazi, this Vatican-backed Nazi regime. And, of course, Jorge Bergoglio was being accused by the Argentinians and forced to stand trial for war crimes. And the Vatican, in order to escape their precious Jesuit priest from, per, from prosecution, simply made him pope and thereby gave him diplomatic immunity. Because the pope can be judged by no man. <laughs> now, this pope, law. <laughs> that's right. And this pope who goes around the world kissing little children plays real well in front of the cameras, but the truth is unbelievable. The truth is gut-wrenching. This is a global criminal. Jorge Bergoglio is a global criminal. He brought the Roman Inquisition to Argentina. And the blood that was shed under his watch, we will not know until Christ returns. And to keep him out of prison, they simply made him pope. And the people who see this pope go about Huge crowds thronged to worship him and adore him as Christ's vicar on the earth, Watch, handing him their own babies to be kissed and blessed by this pope is enough to make you vomit. And the world just gobbles it up like chicken soup. What we're going to see in September the 24th is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the self-styled King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is going to come and speak to our joint session of Congress, and he presumes to speak in our behalf. He does not speak in my behalf. Let me tell you something else about this Jesuit priest. He was the Jesuit provincial, the most powerful man in all of Argentina a professed Jesuit of the fourth vow who swore an oath. And we, you and I and Walt and many of the listeners have read that oath. This Pope who goes about kissing little children, what does it say in that oath? That they would rip open the stomachs and the wombs of our women and crush their infants' heads against the walls. That's what he swore to do to the children of Protestants, to the children of non-Roman Catholics. And we're talking, and you talk about what, what harms children more than anything. What is the most visible harm in the world against children? Poverty, Africa. The poverty-stricken countries. Take, for instance, even the Roman Catholic countries south of the United States border, Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, all of South and Central America. What is the most visible horror against children down there? Don't forget Brazil. Poverty. Brazil. The greatest, yeah. the biggest country in the world, Brazil. Yeah, where there was this um, World Cup of football last year, it was, I guess. Yes, and those uh, are... they, had to, they had to get rid of the children in the streets for when officials and so came down there. They didn't see the poverty over there. Yeah. How did they get rid of those children? Put them in Catholic homes. Yeah. So there were some stories that leaked out of Brazil that the, that the, that the state went through with machine guns and just machine gunned them. Homeless children, they, they didn't know what to do with them. They just went through the street, machine gunned them, and threw them all in mass graves, just so the world wouldn't see the poverty of those Roman Catholic countries. Now I ask you, what hope is there in a Roman Catholic country for this Roman Catholic pope? 
and we presume to allow him to speak to our Congress? Only if we are happy to accept a third world status for this country, just like there is in all the other Roman Catholic countries. You know what impoverishes a nation? What makes the children go without? What causes the most suffering for children in this world? War. War. Killing of parents. Killing of fathers in war. No, no one to earn the bread for the family. But who foments the wars and finances the wars? The Jesuits. It says even in their oath that they will take sides on both, both sides of a conflict to manage the conflict, to incite them to deeds of blood that the Holy Roman Catholic Church might be the gainer in the end. It is the role of the Jesuit order to pit one nation against another, to incite them to war, to operate on both sides of the conflict, to keep the conflict going, to keep the bloodshed going, to finance both war machines, to impoverish those nations, both of money and of blood. And where does that leave the children? Down to them. That in the end, the, the end justifies the means that in the end, the, Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic Church will be the gainer of it all, as also a quote from the Jesuit oath, the fourth oath of induction that you uh, cited there a little bit earlier. So where but, does the uh, suffering of the children come from? It comes from the Jesuits of the Roman Catholic Church. This Jesuit who presumes to go about kissing the cheeks of little children in front of the cameras is responsible for more poverty of children around the world than any other institution in the world. Yeah, thank you, Tom. This was a very good explanation. And um, when you mentioned the uh, Pope's visit to the United States of America in September 2015, you gave me a reason to go over to the next article that we wanted to talk about a little bit. <clears throat> because uh, I, I don't know if we even come to the Catholic Lutheran Accord, because I very much enjoy the conversation we have here just on this one article, and we could go on for hours and hours. Uh, I, I know there's no, no way to stop you, and I don't want to stop you, but uh, we have a little bit of a timeline that we want to keep, and I really would like to read the second article from the Vatican website, news.va, that states, UN Secretary General welcomes papal UN visits. This is from the Vatican Radio. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, has welcomed the visit to United United Nations headquarters by Pope Francis, scheduled for September 25th. In a statement issued on Wednesday afternoon, the Secretary General says, quote, His Holiness, Pope Francis, will visit the United Nations headquarters on the morning of 25th September 2015. End quote. The statement goes on to say, quote, The Secretary General welcomes the visit of Pope Francis as an important part of a historic year in which the United Nations marks its 70th anniversary and in which member states will take major decisions about the sustainable development, climate change, and the future peace and well-being of humankind. During the visit, Pope Francis will address the United Nations General Assembly, hold meetings with the Secretary General, and the President of the General Assembly, as well as participate in a town hall gathering with the United Nations staff. Ban Ki-moon's statement concludes saying, quote, The Secretary General is confident that His Holiness Pope Francis' visit will inspire the international community to redouble its efforts to achieve human dignity for all through ensuring greater social justice tolerance and understanding among all of the world's peoples, end quote. And that's the end of the article. So he will redouble its efforts to achieve human dignity for all through ensuring greater social justice. That means even more shifting money from the poor to the rich or from the righteous to the wicked. Tom, any comment on this article? 
Yes, this uh, this word that you see bantered about so much uh, uh, with regard to the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy is social justice. The papacy is all about social justice. What does social justice mean? You have to go by the Vatican's definition of social justice. When the Vatican speaks of social justice, they speak about a definition that they authored. Social justice in the Roman Catholic Church goes back to what we said in the previous article. No one may have God as father who does not have church as mother. And what goes along with that statement is a motto that is often quoted by the Roman Catholic Church. And it goes like this. Everything to the church and everything from the church which is equivalent to saying everything to the state and everything from the state, because the state serves the church and implements this motto. And that's facts on the ground that we can see today. Everything goes to Washington and then is redistributed to the people. That is social justice. That is how the Vatican institutionally, governmentally, by every by every institute of man, takes from the righteous and gives to the wicked. It goes along with Pope Benedict XVI's uh, encyclical entitled Caritas in Veritate, where Pope Benedict XVI literally made himself a global Robin Hood, that it is his prerogative, his sole prerogative, to take from the rich nations of the world and redistribute that wealth to the needy nations of the world. And who are the wealthy nations of the world? Those who were liberated from papal tyranny back in the old world order at the time of the Protestant Reformation. It's Protestant nations who are wealthy. It's Roman Catholic nations and other idolatrous nations that are poor. And the Vatican takes to itself the divine prerogative, they say, to redistribute the wealth. And they call it social justice, to take from Protestants, to take from the righteous, and give to the wicked. And they've done that through foreign trade agreements. They've done it through taxation. They've done it by taking the manufacturing, the high-paying jobs out of this country and putting them in third-world countries. NAFTA and GATT, you know, the, the giant sucking sound that Ross Perot talked about? He saw all this coming. And it's, it has already taken place. And now the papacy is just announcing it. The papacy has established itself as the global Robin Hood, and social justice simply means from the Vatican's point of view, which is the only point of view that makes any difference, that only that's the only point of view that counts, is to take from the rich Protestant nations and give to the wicked, idolatrous, and Roman Catholic nations. And that's what we've seen. And uh, they call it social justice. Protestantism can no longer be seen as righteous. Protestantism can only be seen as selfish as materialistic, as a failure, in that it failed to take care and raise up the rest of the nations in the world. You know, Israel was once the bright shining on the uh, shining city on the hill, Jerusalem. The order that God established for the, for the Israelites was to be example for every other nation, that they were to look at the Jewish nation and its God and marvel at it and to covet it. God was going to use Israel to bring all the other nations to itself. And that's what the United States could have been. It could have brought all the other nations to Christ were it still a Protestant nation. But like the Jews before us, we've abandoned our Protestantism. We've become ecumenical. 
We've become little Catholics in training. And the United States is no longer a shining city on a hill to draw all men to Christ. The United States now is to draw all men to Antichrist. And the United Nations is simply another Vatican governmental institution set up by the papacy, coddled by the United States of America and promoted around the world, and it too is to become a global government, a government du jour that is obedient to the papacy. That's why the papacy is invited to come and speak and to talk about his social justice, about tolerance and understanding. So the Rome's version of social justice, tolerance, and understanding can be transmigrated into all the other nations. And all the other nations of the world have to give up their sovereignty to depend upon a global government headed up by the papacy so that there is a global redistribution of wealth and that every man, woman, and child must participate in this global redistribution of wealth. It's a global attack on Protestantism and Protestant nations. And they call it holy. They call it righteous to take from wealthy and affluent and blessed Protestant nations and give them to heretic nations, to idolatrous nations, and to Roman Catholic nations. It's happening right before our very eyes, and no one perceives it for what it is. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Well, this was quite a lengthy um, starting of our broadcast, but uh, I think we leave these two articles now where it is and give the people some time to reflect on this when they were listening to this, um, that they can reflect on the articles and um, study it a little bit for their own if uh, what we said here, how we analyzed it, and mostly, of, of course, you, Tom, how you analyzed what is said here, if that really is true or not. Um, I can only say people who think that the state is there to, to owe them something, to give them something, you first have to think of the state doesn't have any money at all except for the money that he first takes from you and then redistributes. And this redistribution to achieve a higher social justice, as the Pope calls it, will be done and maybe will be done even by uh, get rid of the financial system that we have right now. Some people call it the petrodollar. It's the Federal Reserve notes and all this fiat money that we have in all the countries in the world that are ruled by a central bank and I think there are only a country of three left that do not have a Rothschild controlled and by Rothschild of course I mean Vatican because the Rothschilds are only the guardians of the Vatican treasure. Um, there are only two or three countries left in this world that don't have a central bank yet. And then it comes time to crush all this. And then, of course, they will say, well, it didn't work. Now we're going to introduce a new system, and then you're going to have to use that system because the old system, they, they, saw, they, they said, you see, this didn't work. And then they have a very good reason to redistribute all the wealth in the world. And it started already in the United States of America and also here in Europe by where we, are, we have given up everything that we produce ourselves. I mean, uh, what in the United States of America do you have over of really production over there? What do we have over here in Europe? Oh, our mines are closed. Uh, our uh, big companies that build cars uh, are away. And, and just have a look at Detroit and uh, study a little bit the city of Detroit, that great city, <laughs> well, you can call it like that, that was in the 50s or the 60s, the engine of the American economy. And look at Detroit today, what has become of it. And that is only an example that will happen to your whole country and that will also happen to over here in Europe when that comes all together. But I think now we should leave these two articles and uh, concentrate back on the um, uh, Joint Declaration of Justification, um, that article that Richard Bennett wrote on the Catholic Lutheran Accord. And um, last time we uh, finished reading the Joint Declaration and the Judgment of the Sovereign God and we have to continue now on page four of the PDF document with the headline, The Joint Declarations Claim. 
and uh, I will start reading from that here, and uh, then we will see when uh, Tom comes in, and we're going to do a little bit discussion on what I've just read. I'm going to start now. The Joint Declaration's claim. The Joint Declaration document alleges, quote, that the consensus in basic truths of the doctrine of justification exists between Lutherans and Catholics, unquote, and, quote, that the mutual condemnations of former times do not apply to the Catholic and Lutheran doctrines of justification as they are presented in the Joint Declaration. And this is taken from the Annex to the Official Common Statement, Part 1, page 43. Notwithstanding these statements regarding the relevant condemnations by the Church of Rome on those who hold to the biblical uh, gospel have never been revoked or recanted, the current dogma of the Catholic Church upholds the teaching of the Council of Trent and declares that it is infallible. From sixth session of the Council of Trent, the following curses still stand. Canon number nine, quote, if anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified, so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification, and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. End quote. And canon number 11 from the Council of Trent reads, quote, If anyone shall say that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, or by the sole remission of sins, to the exclusion of the grace and the charity, which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and remains in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. End quote. There are two important points here. The first one is, from a Roman Catholic perspective, as will be seen, these condemnations do in fact stand because the joint declaration does not contradict either. And the second point, from a biblical, historical, Lutheran viewpoint, however, these anathemas of Trent fall under the wrath of God. And that concludes the second point. Thomas, is there something you have to say up to here? Yes, plainly, according to the scriptures, it is by grace, unmerited, unmerited favor. It is by grace through faith. The subject, uh, the, the substance of things not seen, whereby we are justified. It is by grace through faith that we are justified, and not of works, lest any man should boast. The Roman Catholic Church claims to have found communion with the Lutherans. And there appears, at least from what they're portraying to the rest of the world, there appears to be no difference between the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics now regarding justification. But the Council of Trent lays down the gauntlet to Protestants whether they be Lutheran or any other denomination. If you should say that we are saved by grace through faith alone, that righteousness is imputed to us the very moment that we accept Christ as our propitiation for sin, we have become a heretic and are anathema, in other words, cursed by the Roman Catholic Church. Put it plainly, if you believe what God said in his book, the King James Version of the Bible, and restated over and over and over in that book how we are justified, if you believe that Bible in what it says just the way God wrote it, you are a heretic, you are anathema, you are accursed. Now, if the Lutherans want to find communion with the Roman Catholic Church, who says that we are justified by baptism, then let the Lutherans go. But God's people will never go back to Rome. It's justification by works. A work called baptism 
which Rome, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church claims is a sacrament. They have defined it as a sacrament. And when they define something as a sacrament, they have sole jurisdiction over it. They own it lock, stock, and barrel. And if you say that you've baptized someone outside of the Roman Catholic Church, your baptism, according to the Roman Catholic Church, does not stand. You come under the, 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 the authority of, of the church and its definitions, and they own you. Their justification is through the church. Again, like we said earlier, Rome has a law. One may not have God as father who does not have the church as mother, the Roman Catholic Church as mother. And what the Lutherans are simply uh, appear, at least, to be capitulating to is that Rome is the mother church. And they are trying to conform themselves to the image of Rome. And it is apostasy. It is the rejection of the gospel in favor of another gospel and another Christ, the papacy. And much, much praise belongs to Richard Bennett for writing this document, for analyzing this voluminous uh, joint declaration on the doctrine of justification jointly uh, uh, created by the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics. He has read it and digested it, and no one is more qualified to assess this document than Richard Bennett because for 22 years he was a Roman Catholic priest. He knows pontifical language. He knows uh, Pope speak is what I call it. He knows Pope speak. He can read a Roman Catholic doctrine and a uh, document and not be deceived by, by it, uh, about its true meaning. And Richard Bennett has, war has written this document to warn everybody that there is no, that Rome never changes and that there is no negotiation whatsoever with the man of sin or with the synagogue of Satan in Rome. And these Lutherans have been duped. And uh, this is a warning to the rest of the Christians in the world to abandon this ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church because it is a complete repudiation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for that explanation there. So the next part in the PDF is a little bit lengthy just with headlines and explaining the contents of the Joint Declaration. I will shorten that a little bit in because it is not so interesting to go through all these little points mentioned here, because we will see that later on when we are talking about these. Uh, but the contents of the Joint Declaration are the following. It consists of five main divisions, with the entirety subdivided into 44 numbered paragraphs. The fourth main division, the lengthiest of the five, is broken down into seven sections, an overview being as follows. And I'm not going to read this overview right here, because it is very lengthy and uh, not very interesting to listen to over the radio. But the point is that um, the official common statement ratifies the joint declaration. This begins with three paragraphs, follows, uh, followed by the words, quote, By this act of signing, the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation confirm the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification in its entirety. The official common statement has an annex with four sections. Finally, section two has five subsections, A to E. What you have to understand, of course, when I'm reading this, is um, this is a document made from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, most and for all, and the Lutherans just signed it. That's the way that I understood it anyway. <laughs> and um, the point being is they make everything that is so easy, they make so complicated. Have you ever read a Bible that is so complicated in this section and that section and uh, paragraphs here and paragraph there? No. The Bible is 66 books. Every book is... <clears throat> then subjected into uh, chapters and the chapters into verses. Very easy to follow. But here you can see, <clears throat> sorry, here you can see how they really try to make things complicated. And when they are this complicated, nobody will understand it. So we try to uh, get the next very important point out of this paper that Richard Bennett wrote, 
And that is a very interesting point, much more interesting than to go into in what sections it has been divided into. And that is called the stumbling at the rock of offense. The joint declaration must be analyzed in the light of biblical truths. What was true for Israel in the Apostle Paul's analysis applies in this instance. Quote, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And this is taken from Romans 9.31 and uh, Romans, uh, to Romans 10 verse 3. The biblical rock of offense is Christ Jesus. The rock on which one believes for ex extrinsic justification, that is, imputed righteousness. One must remember from the outset that the issue at hand is justification. Error always cloaks itself in reasonable sounding phrases and often makes use of the scheme of Satan to twist the scriptures. The joint declaration is replete with uh, quote-unquote reformation-like language in scripture quotations. A characteristic vagueness and impreciseness permeates the document. Certain sentences can be read and assented to by a biblical Christian, but when the slant of meaning is examined, each is seen to be the opposite of what the first seemed to say. Well, <laughs> I just have to say here, yeah, this is exactly that kind of confusion that I meant when, when, I, when I said, do you see how this is all in part here? Well, yeah, something this, to this, say yes, here. yes, this is what makes Richard Bennett so important yeah. because he understands Pope speak. He knows how the Vatican subtly, ever so subtly, twists the meanings of things. Sophistry and sophistry, right? Yes, Sorry, yes. Jesuit, Jesuit, Jesuit sophistry and sophistry. That's yes, exactly indeed. in what, what we have here. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And and Richard Bennett has waded, waded through this document using his years and years of experience in Roman Catholicism to tell us what the true meaning of this document is. And that's why this is, this is so important for the listeners. So I'm going to continue. The conclusions arrived at are similar to the deception of Jacob in the 27th chapter of Genesis. Quote, the voice is Jacob's voice but the hands are the hands of Esau, unquote. Quote, unquote, the voice of the joint declaration is distinctly that of the scriptures. The hands, um, yeah, the hands, quote, unquote. However, <clears throat> are the hairy hands of, home, of Rome. The document is filled with doublespeak. And doublespeak is what we just mentioned, Jesuitical, casuistry, and sophistry. It claims to explain a common understanding of the doctrine of justification and then adds encumbrance upon impediment to the purely scriptural, holy objective, holy juridical nature of the doctrine. There is no better way to assess the guile of the joint declaration in its attendant official common statement than by comparing it to what the word of God declares to be truth. you have something uh, to add here, Tom? No, he's just restating the fact that careful examination of this document and its contents compared with the written word of God, it is evident, it is starkly evident that they have twisted the gospel to come to the, their preconceived conclusion, and that is ecumenism, that, that the righteous should return to the Roman Catholic Church that the Protestant Reformation was a grievous error and an assault against the legitimate throne of God in the papacy, and that Protestants ought to renounce their Protestantism and come back to the Roman Catholic Church under Rome's terms, and that is justification by baptism and other works, the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. And the reason this document is so uh, 
uh, convoluted and so complicated is so that people, who, Bible believers who read it, will see that there is Scripture interlaced all throughout, but then they are unable to read the rest of the document that explains the true intent of the document. So they're liable to accept this on face value simply because it's littered with so much Scripture. And, un, and being unable to decipher the rest of the document because of the Jesuit sophistry and casuistry, they're simply lured into a trap. It's Rome's way of, of deceiving Bible believers to put Scripture out in plain language and then expound upon these doctrines in such a way that it cannot be deciphered unless you are a priest of the Roman Catholic Church like Richard Bennett, who was gloriously saved and is now exposing the Vatican's uh, duplicity in this, in, in this document. Well, the next headline is something really to think about. It's called Trent and New Garments. Of course, referring to the Council of Trent and New yes, Garments. Yes, and by the way, that Council of Trent was convened and then ran by the Jesuit order. It from was the beginning the, to the end. Yes, from beginning to end. And what it was, what the Council of Trent was, was a de an open declaration of war by the Vatican against Protestantism. It enumerated all Protestant doctrines and damned them with anathemas and condemnations. And well, we've it, already read a couple of them. So the <laughs> Council of Trent needs to be understood. And they're just recouching the Council of Trent in other terms. Go ahead, Yerk. It, no, it is no coincidence that they founded the Jesuit order in 1540, and five years later, the Jesuits had time the five years in between to prepare for the Council of Trent that they, lent, that they led from the first to the very last day, 18 years long, in different sections, of course, that was held. It's not that they sit there, uh, sat there 18 years in the same chair or something like that, but they had little pauses in there. But that was, of course, the answer that Rome needed to the Reformation that came up in the 1520s and 1530s. And all the countries that fled away from Rome had to be brought, had to be brought back under the wings of Rome. And therefore, they needed the Council of Trent. And now we are seeing Trent in new garments. What's that all about? Well, Vatican II that ran between 1962 and 1965, the end of 1965, I think it ended somewhere in October of 1965, was not anything new, but it was just a confirmation of the Council of Trent 400 years later. Do you think it's coincidence that the Council of Trent stopped in 1563 and 400 years later, Vatican II just started? 399 years? <laughs> no, that's no coincidence. And everything that has been decided at Vatican II, the start of the ecumenical movement, that is what we've seen turning out here in, of course, the Catholic Lutheran Accord. Because that is the first big step that they took some 30 years after finishing Vatican II. And that's why this next subject here is called Trent in New Garments. And the joint declaration, imputed righteousness, is cleverly sidestepped for the old lie of establishing one's own righteousness. The central point that separated the Reformation from Rome was the biblical doctrine of intrinsic justification. A person is accepted by, all, by the all-holy God only, quote, in the beloved, unquote, and quote, to the praise of the glory of his grace, unquote. This is taken from Ephesians 1, verse 6. The doctrine of imputed righteousness struck the very heart of the Roman Catholic insistence on one being made inherently just. For example, just within oneself. Uh, in the joint declaration, the doctrine of intrinsic impu or imputed righteousness has been wiped out in favor of the Catholic Church doctrine of inherent righteousness. Clearly, the joint declaration is an attempt to do away with the biblical gospel. Thus, 
The official common statement 2A reads, quote, We confess together that God forgives sin by grace and at the same time frees human beings from sin's enslaving power. Joint Declaration number 22. Quote, Justification is forgiveness of sins and being made righteous through which God, quote, imparts the gift of new life in Christ, unquote. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5, verse 1. We are, quote, called children of God, and that is what we are, unquote. That is from first book of John, chapter 3, verse 1. We are truly and inwardly renewed by the action of the Holy Spirit, remaining always dependent on his work in us. Quote, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Unquote. Second Corinthians, uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. The justified do not remain sinners in this sense. Unquote. And this quote was taken from Genesis 27, verse 8. This is a convoluted mixture of the doctrines of justification and sanctification rather than merely a problem of semantics. Justification nowhere in scripture ever means, quote, inherent righteousness, unquote, uh, i.e. being made righteous. The believer's justification is not based on a single iota or anything in him. It is based wholly in his standing in Christ. This is the crux of the matter in the joint declaration. One goes the way of all flesh to the judgment of hell if, it, if he adds anything to the pure and perfect righteousness of Christ. One needs to be, quote, afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of Christ, unquote. That's taken from uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Justification is being declared righteous, not being made righteous. But the joint declaration follows such statement as these with numerous scriptural quotations and phrases cloaking its errors in the semblance of truth. It is quite like Rebecca's word to Jacob, quote, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee, unquote. Thus, quote, Rebecca took godly, uh, goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son, unquote. In the joint declaration, the voice of some of the best scripture texts of justifi on justification is heard. The conclusion, however, is similar to what Isaac discerned. Quote, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau, unquote. The hands of the joint declaration are distinctly those of Rome. The material that is manipulated, however, is that of scripture. Tom, I yes, know you clearly, have a lot to say right here. Oh, yes. Uh, clearly, Rome defines things different. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, grace is infused, okay? It, 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 it becomes, it, uh, through participation in the sacraments, grace is infused into the believer. Now, that is wholly contrary to what the Bible teaches. We are saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And when we accept Christ's propitiation for our sins, then, we, then, then righteousness is imputed to us. In other words, it's an accounting term. You're simply placed from the debit side of the ledger to the credit side, okay? Jesus does it all. Salvation is of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, this trading of the word imputed with infused throws open the door for works justification. When the, when the Vatican, when the Roman Catholic Church talks about faith, they, believe, they mean not faith the way Protestants, not the way the Bible says it, but faith according to the Roman Catholic Church is faith in the sacraments. 
that by participating in the sacraments, the mass, baptism, confirmation, holy matrimony, on and on and on, these are the means by which grace is earned and then infused into the believer. It's entirely a gospel of salvation by works. And these works cannot come from anywhere but the Roman Catholic Church because the sacraments, as they are so-called in the Roman Catholic Church, were defined by the Roman Catholic Church. They, by that definition, have stamped their mark of ownership on those sacraments. And you must participate in their system of salvation. Whereas the biblical imputation of righteousness, not the infusion of righteousness, but the imputation of righteousness is simply when God takes your name from the book of life and puts it into the Lamb's book of righteousness, the Lamb's book of life, he accounts you righteous. Okay? It's an accounting term. The word infuse is a Roman Catholic word. The, Rome, the word impute is a biblical word. Righteousness is imputed to us. There's a passage that Scripture says, And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. God did the accounting. It wasn't Abraham. All he did was believe. When God said something, he believed it, because it was God who said it. And in him there is no lie, no deception, no subtlety, no guile. And when God said something, Abraham believed it. And because he believed, that's all he did. Because he believed God, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That is altogether different than what the Roman Catholic Church says. You're saved by grace in the Roman Catholic Church, but that grace is received through faith in the sacraments. You must be a member of the Roman Catholic Church to participate in those sacraments. You see how the voice sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau? Again, Richard Bennett is telling it like it is. It's not what it seems to be, ladies and gentlemen. This joint declaration on the uh, doctrine of justification, this phony document is nothing but deception. It sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau. And we don't want to have any part of it. And praises go to Richard Bennett for making this this the meaning of this document just stand out from the pages. It takes someone of his talent to read and analyze this document in comparison with the scriptures and the true meaning of the Word of God. And this is a, a hoax. This is deception. This is Jesuit sophistry and casuistry. This is Satan's subtlety. This has the mark of Satan all over it. It's nothing but guile. It's craftiness. And uh, we do well to heed uh, Richard Bennett's warning and the warning of the gospel. Don't be deceived just because it feels or it sounds like Jacob. You've got to test the spirits to see whether they they are of God. And this joint declaration straight from the pit. And its purpose is to destroy Protestantism. Where did Protestantism get its start? Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the one who proclaimed the papacy to be the Antichrist, that the selling of indulgences was contrary to the teaching of Scripture, and so was nearly every other teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. He was finally convicted. We are saved by grace through faith alone, and not of ourselves, not of our works. It is a gift of God, an unmerited gift of God. If you have to pay for it, if you have to perform the sacraments, it's no longer a gift, is it? 
Martin Luther understood this. And this church that calls itself Lutheran today, who would sign a document such as this with the Roman Catholic Church, is not the church of Martin Luther. And uh, we should heed these warnings. Back to you, Yerk. Absolutely, Tom. And uh, when you mentioned this, what I read, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. That reminds me a little bit of Revelation 13. This is also a lamb that speaks as a dragon. Outwardly, it is a sheep. Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Right? That's exactly right. Those people in Washington, D.C., who claim Christian faith, and who would invite the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, to come and speak in a joint session on behalf of the American people? There's no truth in them. There is no truth in them. They sound like Jacob, but they feel like Esau. And what we're seeing is the literal, uh, the first beast of the book of Revelation chapter 13, meeting face to face with his image the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Exactly. That's a very good point there. So the next headline reads, Being Made Righteous. In the justifying act of God, he imputes Christ's perfect righteousness to the individual. It is a legal, one-time, finished, and irrevocable act that cannot be misconstrued to be a process or ongoing occurrence, such, such as the term, quote, being made righteous, unquote, will allow. One must understand that to be made righteous, it is not equivalent or comparable to being made righteous. The simple truth of scripture is stated in Romans 3, verse 22, quote, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that uh, unto all them that believe, unquote. God's demonstration of his own righteousness is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ in his perfect life and sacrificial death. The great news is that this, is absolute, uh, that this absolute righteousness is by imputation, quote, unto all and upon all that, uh, them that believe, unquote. Notice the use of the word imputation. Yeah. Not infused, it's an imputation. It's simply a declaration of God. You are righteous. And how can God declare us righteous? Because he has substituted his blood for ours. He has voluntarily substituted his blood for ours. That's how only he can save. That's how only he knows the instant of salvation in a man's life. When he simply says, my blood covers him. Now, what part in that did I play? All I did was like Abraham, I believed. And Jesus said, salvation has come to Tom's house today. That's simply a transference from my name from the debt from the debit from the credit side of the ledger to the debit side it's god who keeps the books but rome says no the pope keeps the books and you're not saved until the vatican says you're saved and not until you have confessed your sins to a priest you've bowed down and worshiped images and idols you have reputed christ you've accepted the antichrist as your rule of faith You've accepted the Roman Catholic Church and her teachings and her sacraments instead of the free gift of Jesus Christ. That is what this deception is all about. It takes the glory away from Christ. It takes the power away from Christ. It takes away Christ's rightful throne and gives it to a counterfeit, a human being, the papacy. And they simply do not understand the Word of God. They simply do not understand the faith of Jesus Christ nor the gospel. They don't know the way of salvation. It has never entered their hearts or their minds. And for anyone who called themselves a Lutheran or a Protestant to sign any document of agreement with the Roman Catholic Church is a demonstration 
of their apostasy and their rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his salvation, which is imputed, not infused. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Continue reading. Being, quote-unquote, called children of God and, quote-unquote, a new creation is the fruit of believing in Christ. It is what follows on this act, quote, being made righteous, unquote, is just a rewording of the old lie of the Council of Trent in which it was officially declared, quote, justification, which is not merely remission of sins, but also of the sanctification and renewal of the interior man, whereby an unjust man becomes a just man, unquote. In this final word of the joint declaration, the official common statement is the age-old Roman Catholic mixing of sanctification with the act of justification, returning to the age-old fabrication that righteousness is supposedly within the soul, rather than to the biblical truth that by our holy God the believer is credited with the everlasting righteousness that is in Christ Jesus. Quote, Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength, unquote. In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Not in the Pope, not in the <laughs> church. In the Lord I have righteousness and strength. And how do I know I have righteousness and strength? Because God said so. He said it. I believed it. That settled it. And That's it is faith God. And listen, yeah. here is another aspect of this. Justification is salvation. It is an act holy of the Lord. Only he participates in that by moving our name from the credit to the debit side of the ledger. It happens instantaneously. Whenever Christ decides there's salvific faith in Tom for us, then he moves my name to another book. He does the work. And I did nothing but believe in him. And it happened, my salvation happened instantaneously. It was completely out of my control. It was completely out of my influence. And it, the scripture plainly says that it was God that caused me to will and to do his good pleasure. And what was his good pleasure? That I simply received the gift that he offered. That's not the way it's taught in the Roman Catholic Church. You see, if you are being made righteous, it's a process, isn't it? That's not what I just described. That's not what the Bible describes. The Bible, the Bible describes salvation as being an instantaneous transference or an imputation of righteousness. I am accounted righteous. But in the Roman Catholic Church, they are being made righteous through the participation in the sacraments. And I may sound repetitious to some people, but there are so many people in this world that don't know what the Roman Catholic Church is all about and why we should steer clear of it. And this is simply the very basis of our faith. They differ from us on the very basis of their faith. Why? Because it's not the, the, the faith of Jesus Christ at all. It's the faith of Antichrist, the papacy, the synagogue of Satan. It's a cheap counterfeit. It wouldn't deceive a child, and yet it has deceived the whole world. And a world of Lutherans, we should pray for them and but more than that, we should never be caught in the same trickery of Rome. Back to you, Yerk. Okay, thank you, Tom. I'm just going to continue this last paragraph, and uh, that will end the show for today. So continue reading. What is proposed in the Joint Declaration as the quote-unquote doctrine of justification is deficient in two essential ways. It neither upholds the perfect standard of God's holiness, nor does it demonstrate the perfect righteousness of Christ in life and death. In the words of the Apostle Paul, quote, For thy being ignorant of God's righteousness, 
and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Unquote. The Bible emphasizes and declares the righteousness of God. Quote, the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Unquote. This is not proclaimed nor taught in the official common statement on the joint declaration. Destitute and sinful human beings need the perfect righteousness of Christ. This is what the scripture clearly says is now manifest. Quote, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And that is taken from Romans 3 verse 21. And that continues our reading of the Roman Catholic uh, Lutheran Accord for today. I would like to turn to Tom for some closing remarks on the thing that I just read. Yes, we are the recipients of a gift. If you have to work for a gift, it's not a gift. You've earned it. And it is owed to you. In other words... When you enter the gates of the city, you say to the keeper of the door, open the door, I've earned my way in entrance into the city. But in the Gospels, we simply walk to the door and it opens for us because Christ opens and closes the door. That's why he called himself the door. Salvation is of Christ and him alone. If we place anything or anybody between us and that door, we will be shut out. Thanks, Jörg. Yeah, the last phrase that I read here that comes from uh, Romans 3, verse 21, I want to repeat that because you have to let that sink in a little bit to understand it fully. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. What law is referred to here, do you think? That is not the Ten Commandments, but that is the sacrificial law, as, I, as far as I understand it here. Am I right there, Tom, with my thinking? Well, certainly, but we are all violators of the moral law of God. Yeah, of course. And when we violate one of those laws, we violated all of them. You see, that was a covenant with, that God made with the people. That's the standard by which righteousness is measured. That is the standard that Christ and only him obeyed. And it is by that law that God justifies us in Christ. Okay? Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. He didn't violate any one of those Ten Commandments. Commandments which men never keep. We look at that those Ten Commandments and we see those as the standard of righteousness whereby all men are judged. But if Christ takes that judgment and bears our sins upon his body, then we are, as he is, righteous because we believe God and our, sinless, our sinfulness is counted for us as righteous because we believed in the only Son of the living God. Now, you, you, you brought up the sacrificial law. That was replaced by Christ. Okay? He became the Lamb. He became the sacrifice. Okay, it was his blood that was poured out for us. He's the ob he is the oblation. Okay? And we make no more sacrifices for sin. If we do, then we have rejected the sin, the 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 sacrifice that God made for us in his son. Jesus fulfilled the moral law, the 10 commandments, the immutable moral law. That law is eternal. It was by obeying that law that made Christ the spotless lamb fit for the sacrifice to redeem us all to God. No man has, uh, you know, we're born in trespasses and sins. The Bible says we're born in trespasses and sins. 
No one has kept the law perfectly. But we look at that law and we see our shortcomings. We see our sinfulness. When we look at that moral law, each one of those Ten Commandments, which one, if not all of them, have I broken my whole life? And I'm left without hope. I am left without hope except for one, and that's Jesus. Now, anyone who tries to change that law has changed the standard by which Christ redeemed us. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church has changed that law by removing the law forbidding the forbidding the making and bowing down to images and idols. And they've changed the Sabbath from the from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Institutionally, they violate all ten of the commandments. They've issued another standard by which Christ redeemed us. You see, by changing that law, we no longer see the, the sin that God pointed out to us through the law that made us seek salvation in Christ, our substitute. They literally, when they change those Ten Commandments, they nullify what Christ did on the cross. They have no right to change God's law. God wrote his law. It's holy because only he is holy. And no man has the power or the righteousness to change that law. Because to change that law is to change the standard by which Christ redeemed us. We, we may have to talk about this in another discussion to make it clear to the, to, to the listeners. But uh, the law remains. The Ten Commandments remains. As long as Christ remains, those Ten Commandments remain. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, there's a part in the New Testament where it says, uh, now that the law is done away with, shall I sin? No, God forbid, of course. So, of course, the Ten Commandments are still in order. I, I, I didn't mean that. I, I think I, under, I, I misunderstood it a little bit, but now I understand it. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. means we are even righteous without the law that he set in there. Because when we repent of our sins and um, we give our life to Jesus Christ, then our righteousness is being manifested. Is that a That's better way right. to understand it? That's a better way to understand it. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm a baby Christian. I learn every day. <laughs> anyway, Tom, I want to thank you very much for your contribution in our broadcast today. Is there something you have to say for the closing of the show? Nope, that'll be it. Okay, very fine. So I thank you very much for being on the show. Also, Walt, for giving us the opportunity to come here together. I want to thank the guests that have joined us in the chat room here and listened live in our broadcast. And I will also thank, of course, everyone who is watching the video that I will make of uh, this broadcast the coming weekend. And then you can watch it in, uh, in video form and listen to it. And uh, I hope that we will have the possibility next week to come back and um, to spread the word of Christ because this is actually what we are doing. We are not doing this work for our righteousness, <laughs> to call it like that, or for our fame, but we are doing this in the name of Jesus Christ. As you have surely understand when you follow a lot of our broadcasts here, you know that we are living in the end days today. And we have to see to get people out of the deception, the damnable futurist deception that the Jesuits and the Vatican laid upon us after the uh, Reformation came apart. And this joint declaration that we are reading here is another point where they try to take all the apostate churches, the they call apostate churches, the Protestant churches, back under the wings of Rome. That's the only goal they have, because 400 years of Inquisition didn't work, and now they, if the enemy they cannot defeat by war, they are going to embrace him and make him look as a friend. That's what the sheep in wolf's, uh, what the wolf in sheep's clothing is all about when you think about it. So don't fall for the trap, but study the truth. Study the truth in the form of the King James Authorized Version Bible from 1611, and only the King James Version. And read documents like this that have been sent to us from a person, Richard Bennett, who was, I think, 13 years or something in the Roman Catholic Church, a priest, and came out of it because he read Revelation 18, verse 4.
come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, because God has remembered her sins and her iniquities. This is not a full, perfect quote, but you get the idea of it. So, thank you very much for listening. I wish you a nice day further on. Hope to see you next week. Thank you, and bye-bye. God bless.